a show that covers what's going on in the North Shore and provides insight into our local villages and its representatives. Hello, and welcome to another edition of From the Source. I'm Elizabeth Johnson, your host. Today, I'm excited to have as my special guest, Anthony Scaramucci. As most know, Mr. Scaramucci is an entrepreneurial spirit and has created several successful businesses in investing. He's a true leader in the financial industry and has established an annual must-attend hedge fund summit called SALT. He's also the author of several books. His brilliance is well known and he's hand-selected to work on identifying the best and the brightest to fill the various cabinet positions to lead this country under the President of the United States. Then he himself was assigned the role of White House Director of Communications. Now to give us a brief look at the markets and the country is Anthony Scaramucci. Anthony, thank you so Hello. much for it's coming. It's a very nice introduction. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to be here. Well, we're just so happy to have you. You know, you're a native of Port Washington and Long Island. You represent us. We, I can't tell you how proud we are well, of that. Well, it's very nice. Yeah, look, I love, love Long Island. I've spent my entire life on Long Island, uh, but for the time I was at school, I went to Boston for Tufts and Harvard. But other than that, I've been here on Long Island. Yeah, and we appreciate that. You know, you went to uh, Wall Street right away from graduating from college, and it was a little different then. Um, how do you how do you find that uh, the kids that are graduating from schools today finding Wall Street? Uh, tougher. Wall Street's a tougher place uh, today than it was when when I came out of school. We we came out of school in the mid '80s. Uh, it was during the Reagan presidency, and there was a Reagan economic boom taking place. And but for the '87 crash, the stock market from 1982 up to '87 was doing very, very well. It was sort of uh, in uh, August of 1982, the bear market of the '70s ended, uh, and then we we saw a 10% uh, a rise in the stock market in the month of sep uh, August into September of 1982. And so uh, uh, the Wall Street movie uh, with Bud Fox and Gordon Gekko, right. that came out in December of 1987. And so it was heady times uh, for, for Wall Street. And Wall Street was probably way less regulated than it is today. And so now, 30 years later, uh, kids coming to Wall Street, uh, there's still great opportunity. There's still a, uh, a great way to start a career. It's a great way to continue a career, but it's just a different environment. Now it's a little harder to make money, uh, way more regulated. Uh, the bigger banks have a tendency now to get smaller returns on their equity capital post-global financial crisis. Right. And that's a direct result of the regulation. But the good news is, is those banks are very solvent from a fiscal perspective. Uh, and so I don't see any banking crisis ahead or things like that. But it's just a little bit tougher, okay. harder for kids today. So your background, you went to Harvard Law, right? And um, I always actually uh, tell my kids that they should have a, a legal background because everything is entwined with the law these days. And you, um, do you find that that was critical when setting up your company? Well, it definitely helped. I mean, you know, I went to law school for uh, very naive reasons. You know, uh, my dad worked, uh, for people familiar with the area, he worked at McCormick Sand and Stone. Then he crossed the street and worked at Gotham Sand and Stone, which was on East Shore Road in Port, Port Washington. Mm -hmm. And so my parents were with the college. They had sort of a limited idea of what going to school was, but uh, typical of the people that wanted their kids educated, my, my folks were like, go be a doctor or, or be a lawyer. Right. And so I had this limited view of what being a lawyer actually was. And so uh, by the time I was 21, 22, I had, I had gotten into Harvard Law School and I'd worked at a law firm and had done my first year of school. And I realized, you know, maybe the law practicing it uh, was probably not right for me. And so I ended up going to Wall Street and then ended up uh, after seven or eight years at Goldman Sachs starting my own business. But but it's definitely helped. Uh, I think the, the best thing I can say about my legal education, which is very true for today's politics, a good legal education allows you to take two opposing ideas and to synthesize them in your mind to see where you think there are elements of truth on both sides. 
And so it provides uh, an analytical capability, a sense of objectivity about analytics, and it doesn't hurt to be able to read these contracts and have a sense for legal language because uh, it's probably helped me in negotiations and has certainly reduced my legal bills over the years. That's wonderful. Now, Sky, Skybridge Capital continues under your management. With this volatile econ ec economic environment, where do you see the opportunities, or are they all over? So, so well, well, for Skybridge, we've always been a very defensive firm. Uh, my attitude uh, in making money and creating capital uh, for clients and financial independence for myself was to go slow. I, I always believed in that the uh, the tortoise and the hare, that the right. turtle was gonna win the race. And so for me, it's a six, seven, eight percent return in our very low interest rate environment. Now it could be a six to eight percent re return versus a nine to 10% return. And so I try to uh, put us into low volatile situations um, uh, because we should be doing as a hedge fund business, we should be providing a defensive mechanism for our clients. You could have your stock portfolio and it could have that unevenness and uncertainty and the volatility, but you're, you're upwardly biased as long as you can hold it for 10 or 20 years. You can have your bond portfolio, which should be stable. And what Skybridge is really trying to provide is a buffer, a hedge, if you will, to those other strategies in your in your portfolio. And so uh, for me, if I can get, like I said, six to 10% a year uh, with very, very little volatility, um, and we find that right now in residential mortgages and in structured credit, which is tied to some of the community banks, uh, but I, I don't really have any positions in the stock market right now. Interesting. Um with the upcoming SALT conference that you are, have put together, this is a, a must-attend uh, event for all hedge fund managers. Um, you are having it in Abu Dhabi this year in December. Can you give us a little glimpse of what you're going to be talking about there? Yeah, so we, we've done the conference uh, uh, 10 times in Las Vegas. That's usually the home for the conference for the domestic United States. I've done it twice in Singapore, once in Tokyo. Uh, we worked with the uh, Abu Dhabi government, uh, the UAE, and the Abu Dhabi Global Markets Forum. Uh, to put this conference in Abu Dhabi because I just, you can just see what's going on over there, whether it's the tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran or the issues related to Turkey and Syria. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is very well positioned in that region. And there should be, if we can reduce conflict and have peace in the region, there should be tremendous growth and opportunity coming out of that region. And of course, Abu Dhabi is one of the great modern cities. Uh, it, it, right. it and its sister city, Dubai, uh, to me, are the, uh, represent the future. Uh, they represent what modern cities will likely look like, and they also have a sustainability element to them, uh, and they're well positioned, uh, if you look at a map, that you can get to almost anywhere from Abu Dhabi, uh, whether it's into the subcontinent of India, up over to Beijing, or out into Europe. Uh, and so it's, it's a place where I predict Skybridge will have an office at some point. Um, and, and we're going to have a very, very good event. I like bringing people together that typically don't get along. Uh, and so we've, we've paired people like uh, Susan Rice, but then we've also had somebody like uh, General Kelly at the same meeting. We've had uh, Richard Branson and Condoleezza Rice. We've had uh, four or five prime ministers from the UK, uh, three or four defense secretaries from the United States, two American presidents, uh, President P uh, George W. Bush and President Clinton. But we've also had presidential candidates like uh, Governor Mitt Romney or this past year, Tulsi Gabbard, that, that's running. She's the representative from Hawaii. And so my attitude about these conferences is very similar to what we were talking about in legal education. Let's make this thing uh, very uh, ideological, but very bipartisan. So yes, you can come with a very strong and strident position from the left or from the right, uh, but let's be civil to each other. And so this has been a lot of fun for people. People, uh, you know, you, you'd be blown away at the friendship that somebody like uh, Karl Rove, the Republican strategist, has with Donna Brazil, the Democratic strategist, um, when you go to events like that. 
seems like you like to bring people together and they really talk. Well, well it's fun <laughs> for me. I, you know, people are upset with me or they have a different opinion to me or they say things that are nasty. I don't take it personally. And uh, I understand if you have a public life, however small or large it is, people are ultimately going to have an opinion of you. And uh, I, you know, somebody said to me, well, Jesus, some people say some mean things about you. I said, well, look, if you're in the NFL and you're wearing a helmet and you're going across the field and someone tackles you, you can't complain about it. And so if you decide to go into politics and have a public life, um, I often tell people, let's have a little bit of civility. This uh, past year, uh, Governor Christie and uh, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions were a little sore at each other. And so I made the decision to pair them on stage together. Uh, they really? were both, yeah, they were both a little mad at me when I did it, <laughs> uh, but it turned out that it worked out for them, and they've they've rekindled their friendship, which is a good thing to see. It's interesting how the uh, these individuals actually have stepped away from the limelight, but yet you go forward into that. Tell me why you decided to, you know, you had a situation that occurred. Well, you, well, no, I got fired. I mean, I, I made a mistake. It was actually a, a reporter that grew up in Oyster Bay. His father was good friends with my dad. I was talking to him, which I thought was off the record. I technically did not say, quote unquote, this is off the record. And so he recorded it and he ran to CNN with it. And, uh, you know, I said some uh, regrettable things about Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus. I'm not saying that they weren't true. They were definitely true. They were just not <laughs> appropriate things to say. And so I ended up getting fired. Uh, and I took it well. I mean, at the end of the day, I never blamed anybody for it. Um, I tell young people when I speak at schools or local high school or university, uh, be accountable for your mistakes. Don't, don't try to pretend that it was someone else's mistake or it wasn't your fault. Uh, yeah, I thought I was off the record, but that was my mistake, uh, trusting somebody that I shouldn't have trusted. And so, um, but after being accountable for your mistake, the second move that you have to make is you have to be forgiving of yourself. Um, I don't wake up in the morning and kick myself in the pants and say, geez, I made a mistake in the White House, and so let me hold my head low today. I, I wake up in the morning very excited about today and the future, but I decided to stay in the, in the public light because I think that the there's a lot of... Uh, things that are going to happen over the next 15 to 25 years that responsible people, people that really love the country and love their families and, you know, want to see good things happen for the country, they've got to speak out and they've got to be open to new ideas. I think with the rancor and the partisanship and the polemics and the way people are going after each other now, um, we have to resolve that. We have to resolve that for our children and our right. grandchildren. So I have no problem sticking my neck out into that. And I have no problem debating people or uh, explaining to them my position. And, and, and again, I don't take things personally. I think that's a very key thing. Uh, you learn when you go through a situation like I had inside the White House, whether or not you have a thick skin or not. And so it turns out I have a thick skin. So I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> well, you wrote this beautiful book, Trump, the blue collar uh, present, yeah. where you make a lot of similarities to um, uh, your background and Trump's, um, and actually are supportive of him. And I know that you are, continue to be supportive of the President of the United States, but yet you have um, made known recently that you find some of his uh, actions. Yeah, well, well, I'm in the book. I basically write about my observations on the campaign. I write about, uh, I try to draw an analogy, not necessarily saying that our lives were similar because they were very different lives, but I tried to tell the arc of two different families and their pursuit of the American dream. One was the uh, Trump fa family, really starting with his dad, Fred Sr., right. how he got into the real estate development business, how he started building residential properties for middle and lower middle class people, well, what Fred Trump's philosophy was for growth, how it differed from uh, Donald J. Trump. Uh, flip side of that, I was telling the, uh, the story of my family, uh, where uh, my dad's uh, parents uh, moved to a coal mining town and northeastern Pennsylvania, right. and my mother's family uh, settled in Port Washington because by luck there were other families from the town that they left Italy from that were there that signaled to them that Port Washington was a good place for Italian immigrants. And so I'm just simply trying to say that there was an arc 
of, of two American dreams, two stories of American families. And it was an improbable intersection of my arc with uh, Mr. Trump's. Uh, you know, he grew up uh, very wealthy, uh, uh, went on to live in Trump Tower adjacent to the Tiffany's Jewelry Store, and I live out here on Long Island. But uh, because of uh, political activity, our lives intersected. I was originally with uh, Governor Scott Walker and then uh, Governor Jeb Bush before I, I joined the Trump campaign. Uh, my divergence from the president is nothing personal. Um, I like the president. I still have a fondness for him. And as an American, I obviously would want the president to do very well. Uh, no, no matter who the president is, whether it, it, it was going to be Hillary Clinton or former President Barack Obama, my attitude is I'm a patriot first and a partisan second, uh, and I want the president to do well. Uh, but my issues with the president are, are substantial based on the volatility of his personality, the use of his Twitter feed, which every single one of us inside staff at the White House, outside staff, people inside the campaign said, please, you know, Mr. President, don't use the Twitter feed in this incendiary way. Um, but he, he's decided that he wants to bully people. And so uh, with that, as we know, uh, you don't have to go to a lot of anti-bullying classes here in the Manhasset High School to know that <laughs> bullies have low self-esteem. And so that low self-esteem is hurting his leadership. It's hurting his ability to uh, unite the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, the last straw were the uh, racist tropes and the invective that he sent over to the four congresswomen. I'm a Republican. Um, I don't like the policy positions of what is known as the squad on the Democratic side. They're primarily socialist and progressive leaning congresswomen. But the president said to go back to the country that you came, came from. from. And, and, you know, for me, that's a racist trope that my grandmother heard when she was 18 years old. She got here. Uh, and she, you know, she had a hard time finding a job due to discrimination. She ended up uh, becoming a maid and turning beds. She worked in the hostess laundry. Uh, it's not there anymore, but it was on Willowdale Avenue in Port Washington. And she worked herself up to help me create the life that I've created. Uh, they told her to go back to the country that she came from. She produced three children, one of which was my mom. Uh, two were World War II veterans. One fought on Normandy Beach. So, so for me, he's the leader of the free world. Uh, he is the president of the United States. The first name of the country is United. Uh, in 2019, we shouldn't be talking with that high level of nativism and that high level of racism. And so I rejected that. He didn't like my rejection of that. And so he went after me on Twitter, which he's, he does. You know, that's what a detached narcissist will do. You know, he doesn't care who you are. He'll just go right after you. But uh, more importantly, I think, I think uh, uh, true to what I really dislike is uh, if you think about the lack of boundaries, he not only went after me, totally okay, I'm a public figure, I can handle it, but he went after my suburban housewife. Uh, and so the president knew that uh, my wife and I, uh, Deirdre, who I think you've met, I'm pretty yes. sure you've mm -hmm. met her, uh, we were going through marital problems during the uh, 2017 year when I was White House Communications yes. Director. Uh, my wife had filed for divorce uh, as a result of those marital problems. The president knew that. And so you just have to think of the viciousness and the bullying nature of him. Uh, we've repaired our marriage, and thank God we're doing quite well, knock on wood. And we've got two beautiful young kids at home, but he's attacking a suburban housewife here on Long Island. So you have to think about how disgusting that is coming from the office of the president, particularly after he knows that somebody like me gave him uh, at least a million dollars personally to help him run that campaign, countless hours of media advocacy, and also a great sacrifice to my family. So, you know, the guy's, uh, he's lost it. Um, and I predict he won't win in 2020. At least I, I certainly hope he won't because this sort of uh, way of handling yourself uh, is very, very dangerous. And you can see it's not just me that's left the White House. Uh, there's about 80 or so people that have left the administration. 51 senior people have left the White House in the last 29 months. So, yes, I'm fond of the, the president in some ways, and I applaud what he did by creating advocacy for blue-collar people. Uh, like my parents, you know, when, when I was growing up. Right. Uh, but he really hasn't lived up to uh, that promise, and so we need to reject him at the ballot box come ne uh, November of 2020. Do you feel any Republican would stand up against him? 
Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a big debate right now. You know, I've talked to many Republicans that feel the same way that I do, but um, there's a little bit of uh, hesitancy or a lack of courage or they don't see the potential opportunity to replace him. Uh, uh, and I think that's what, you know, when you talk about the spirit of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs see the future differently than conventional wisdom and they try to curve the future to their reality. And so to me, I think the Republicans would be way better served if they could find a better candidate than him. I think he's going to get slaughtered in 2020. Um, and so if they could find somebody a little bit more competent, a little more normal, I like to say, you know, ma many of the same policies, just a little less crazy, I think would be a better alternative. But uh, John Kennedy wrote three books. He wrote The uh, Why Ellen Slept, A Nation of Immigrants, and his third book was Profiles in Courage. Uh, when, he, when he accepted the award for that book, he said, you know, this was my thinnest of the three books, Profiles in Courage, because there's no courage out there. And so what we find from our political leaders is they, they lack that courage. But I really wish they would speak out and uh, attest to what they're actually seeing inside the White House, because it'll help the American people uh, make a better, more informed decision in 2020. Well, we could go on forever. Talking about the, uh, the politics and people are just very, very strong in what their beliefs are, whether they're Republican or whether they're Democrat. Uh, sometimes I feel the party system is broken altogether because... Well, we're locked now. We're locked into our different silos and we're watching our confirmed biases. We get the news screeching in from the left from MSNBC or screeching in from the right from Fox News. And we, we lock into these confirmed biases where we would be better served to think about ourselves as Americans first and partisans second and, and, and see if we can, we can draw a bridge to each other. Uh, we could certainly solve these problems if, if we did that. You know, uh, whatever you think about the gun issue, uh, when we had the assault ban put on in 1994, mass killings went down. Uh, when we took the assault ban off roughly 13 or 14 years ago, mass killings have gone up. And so for me, I'm a Second Amendment person. I'm a Republican, libertarian by nature. I have no problem with normal people having the right to bear arms and for using those arms for recreational purposes or hunting or things like that. Just using them on other people um, is absolutely devastating. And we have uh, a country to our North Canada Everybody owns a gun. Uh, everyone that wants a gun that's normal can own a gun, uh, but they're shooting them at objects and uh, not people. And so I think we've got to figure out a way to do that here in the United States. I agree. I agree. One of the things uh, at a recent event uh, that you were the guest speaker, you talk, spoke about fake news, and you said that it's going to be more and more prevalent coming up, uh, and it's it's here already, obviously. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, listen, it happened to me. Uh, there was a group of journalists that wrote an article about me, said I was tied to the Russia investigation. Uh, they got uh, misinformation from someone, quote unquote, senior inside the White House. Uh, and uh, so they went out on that with only one source. They didn't check the other sources. When they called me to get my comment, I said, well, why don't you call the Senator McConnell's office or Secretary Mnuchin's office? You'll see that I'm not under investigation by the Senator or the Treasury. Um, of course, they didn't do that. They thought, it, you know, they just wanted to run that story and get the eyeballs that they thought they could get on a story like that. And then I, you know, went, went to the head of CNN and said, listen, I ha unfortunately have to bring a lawsuit against you guys because you're suggesting that I did something wrong and committed a felony when, in fact, I didn't do anything. Right. And so they, they brought the story down. Uh, they bleach bit the story and they fired the three journalists. And so I've been a victim of this sort of fake news nonsense. Uh, there's uh, these real fake videos coming out now. Uh, you can go on Google and Google real fake video where there could be you and I. Uh, they superimpose our faces on different people and then they, they use voice technology to simulate our words and voice. And lo and behold, before you know it, I'm saying things that I never said. But there I am on a video looking just like I look with the same hand gestures and the same intonations. And then you have to go out and rebut the real fake video. And so, right. so the world is uh, definitely changing. Um, I think that uh, journalists in an effort to get stories out in an effort to get eyeballs and traffic and there's some levels of sensationalism that is going on. Um, and we have to try to get back to those more objective Columbia School of Business, you know, the Columbia S School of Journalism, I should say, standards and Missouri School of, of Journalism standards for 
objectivity in journalistic reporting. But yeah, there, there's going to be more fake news. There's going to be real fake videos. Uh, God only knows what will happen with the use of artificial intelligence as we move a couple of decades into the future. Um, but I think that the, the one thing that I have found in my life experience, though, is that the, uh, the American people have a pretty good nose. You know, they, at the end of the day, they can, they can really see who's being authentic to them and who's speaking in a sort of unspun way uh, without all those talking consultant uh, sound bites and so forth, and who really cares and who really doesn't. And so hopefully that will continue to percolate. Do you have any future aspirations to elected office? Well, you know, the truth is I'm accidentally in the political arena. What I, what I used to really like was uh, being a pundit on, uh, on business television and doing things like CNBC or even Fox Business. You may right. now remember this. I hosted a television show for Fox Business before I joined the Trump transition team. I was the host of Wall Street Week. I had Wall taken, Street it, Week I had taken it over from Louis Rukeyser. Uh, we actually bought the show from Maryland Public Broadcasting. It had been off the air for 10 or so years, and we repurposed it and brought it back on the air. And so yeah. I sort of enjoyed that element of television and right. that element of a public profile. Uh, I, I view my entry into politics as sort of this accidental nightmare. I mean, I, I didn't <laughs> want to do it. You know, um, I just got sucked into the vortex. Um, when the president was in transition, we were thinly staffed. They asked me to do a lot of communications from Trump Tower related to the hirings, the cabinet hirings, the sub-cabinet hirings, the, the hiring of Jim Mattis and all those other things that I remember speaking about and being interviewed on. Um, I was originally going to be the president's uh, OPL director, which is his chief networking officer, uh, Rice Previs, for some reason, the chief of staff at that time didn't want me to do that. Uh, I wish he had just come to me, Elizabeth, and said, hey, Anthony, you know, I, I don't like you. I don't want you to do that. But that's not what they do in Washington. They right. do this whole Washington two-step and the backstabbing and all the intrigue started. And so, uh, you know, I didn't get that job, uh, but I, I stayed on it. And uh, when I talked to the president about coming in to help him remove people like Reince Priebus, that's when I ended up with the, the, the communications director's job. And so for me, this whole thing has been very accidental. And so I don't see myself ever necessarily running for office. I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to say to you, Elizabeth, I'm not running for office, and then two years from now I run for office. Because right. uh, I honestly don't know what the future uh, is going to be. Uh, what I tell my kids is that uh, I've lived this improbable life. To think about my dad going to work in that green construction uniform down here on East Shore Road, uh, to finding myself into Tufts, Harvard Law School, Goldman, building two successful hedge fund businesses, having a television show. And whether it was 11 seconds or 11 days I worked in the White House, it's a pretty improbable life. So I don't want to rule anything out, uh, but I, I'm not in love with the whole political thing because a lot of these people are just very dishonest and they're incredibly ruthless. And uh, there's a good reason why our political system in Washington is this dysfunctional. Uh, because they're really focused on ruling as opposed to serving. And, and so I don't know if we could break that fever or break that spell. And I, if I could help do that, would I have an interest in that? Maybe. Uh, but right at this point, I would say no, only because I'm having so much fun in my career right now and, 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 and growing my business at Skybridge. I know that you have um, your own media company, Scaramucci Post. Yeah. And you also have a podcast with your wife, which is wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I. Well, the podcast with my wife is a lot cheaper than therapy. <laughs> so we could have we could have gone into therapy, or we could have had a forty-five minute podcast where she takes a cheese grater to my forehead. So I thought you know that this would be cheaper, less expensive, and more expressive. Well. I have to thank you so much for being on oh, a, the show. It's a big honor to be here, and I have a tremendous amount of pride in Long Island, and thank you for everything that you do well, thank you uh, for, for this great area. For being here, and I hope you come back. Okay, anytime. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching From the Source. Tune in next time for more in-depth interviews with members of your community. <laughs> <laughs>